Hello, everybody, and thanks for joining today. And uh, my name is Daniel O. Oh, I'm from uh, United States of Boston area, and then here's my colleague, James Faulkner. Yes, my name is James Faulkner. I'm from, uh, also with Red Hat. Um, I'm from Orlando, Florida. Um, so today we're gonna be talking about uh, distributed tracing um, with OpenTelemetry, Knative, and a project called Quarkus. How many of you have heard of Quarkus? Just out of curiosity, you got a few hands raised there. Oh, good. Yeah, good. Um, so Quarkus is a, is a Java framework. Um, it's not the, the, the central piece of this uh, discussion today. We kind of want to more talk about observability in general and how it applies in the Java community um, and how you can take advantage of this to you know, in, enhance how you develop and more importantly, how you deliver software to production um, and how you recover from failures when things go wrong. Um, so I'm going to start, we'll spend about 20 minutes uh, talking about some um, basic uh, concepts in this space and then uh, some recent changes in this space and then Daniel will also talk about a little bit more in depth and we actually have a demo prepared for you uh, to showcase how um, open telemetry is an important part of what we do at Red Hat and hopefully something to consider when you're uh, trying to build your uh, observability stacks in your uh, projects. So we'll start with um, an introduction. This is Daniel. Yeah, so I'm developer advocate at Red Hat and a bunch of stuff in the CNCF ambassador. And here's my Twitter. Uh, you can just uh, follow me or reach out to me if you have any question around this kind of topic and the CNCF uh, open source community stuff. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's me over there uh, two decades ago in Kamakura nearby <laughs> uh, Yokohama here. Um, I visited, had an opportunity to visit the first time. I used to work at Sun Microsystems. We were doing Solaris training and um, we, we stopped in um, Yokohama to do that training and then we took a side trip. So um, awesome to be back uh, in Japan. Um, so same guy. <laughs> same guy, <laughs> a few years younger. 20 few years ago. A few pounds lighter, a few kilos lighter. A um, little bit more hair back then. Um, but um, yeah, so happy to be back here. So let's talk about um, telemetry and tracing and observability. So I just kind of want to start out uh, describing what is observability, what does that mean? Obviously from the English word, it means you can see something, but more importantly, uh, you, can, you can understand it. You can process it. You can think about and rationalize what you're actually looking at. So it's more than just being able to see something. It's being able to draw conclusions and be able to perceive changes in it and you know, potentially take actions to change what you're seeing here. Um, one of the early advances in this space was in the application performance monitoring space. So you know, having like an agent sitting on a system, um, watching a process and, and taking some metrics possibly from that and maybe visualizing what that looks like. Um, and we'll talk about how that industry has evolved and what we're doing in this space in the open source community and in CNCF in particular um, for how that um, is really hopefully improving the state of the art here. Uh, but one also important aspect of observability is that you can't or you should not make assumptions about what you're trying to observe. Um, you know, if you have one angle into one, one viewpoint on a particular system, you're only going to get data from that one viewpoint. And the only conclusions you can draw are those that relate to that kind of one simple viewpoint. Um, taking into consideration a much larger set of viewpoints allows you to answer questions you didn't even know you needed to ask in the past, right? So being able to have enough observability that you can answer questions that you're not even sure you might need to know um, in the future is really important when building systems. Um, this also applies outside of the technology space. Um, this may be familiar to some of you. Um, <laughs> so, so this is one viewpoint, uh, one metric, right? One, one, one screen capture, one view, video angle of, as you all know, uh, from the, uh, the game earlier last week. Um, and from this picture, right, you can conclude, well, it's way out of bounds, right? <laughs> Look how so much space is there, right? So clearly, it's out, and Japan should not have gotten that goal. <laughs> um, but if you consider a system where you have multiple viewpoints, right, you, didn't, you never knew this might come up. No one could have predicted this. But right, if you have a different view, you can kind of understand that, well, yeah, it actually was in because we have these other views. And it's a good thing that we had multiple views of this particular space. Um, because we're able to answer the question more accurately um, and obviously to the benefit of Japan, which is awesome. Um, so, so it applies here, also applies in, in our world. Um, 
So when thinking about observability, one place you might want to start is, as a developer, what kinds of questions might you potentially ask in the future? What is the health of my application, right? Is my application up and running? Is it starting, but it's not running? Is it starting, but unable to you know, talk to a database or something? Um, if something goes wrong, what happened? Why did, why did that happen? How can I uh, fix that? If my application is up and running and operating as expected, what about if it's operating too slowly and it's affecting the customer experience, right? These are the kinds of questions that you might want to ask in the future. Um, and observability can help you answer those questions. So uh, this is a little bit controversial, but um, it's easy. It's an easy model, especially to those who are new to observability. It's a great place to start. Um, these are the observability pillars. These are the things that the, 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 the types of, of information uh, that you would want to collect if you're doing more than just observing a, one specific metric, right? Metrics are obviously an important part of that. Metrics are sort of a, you know, uh, the, the amount of memory that a, that a uh, process is taking um, over time. You can graph that, right? CPU load, you can graph that. Number of HTTP failures over time, you can graph that. Uh, these are important to, to understand the particular state of a system at a given time or over a period of time. Log files are also very important. This is sort of an immutable time series of things that occurred in the past that so you can go back and look, potentially even replay, uh, depending on the, the, the sophistication of your, of your logging system. You can actually replay and get to a point and kind of understand the state of the system at any particular time with a sophisticated log, or you just have a simple log with you know, HTTP access log. Uh, but these are really critical to understanding uh, what could have potentially led up to a given problem. And then, and then tracing, and we'll, we'll focus on tracing a little bit more in this talk. Um, tracing is a record of a single service invocation along with all of its downstream service invocations. So if you make a call to a RESTful service and it makes a call to another service and another service and then a database, then maybe a message queue, right? All of these things are related. And so having a trace of that with enough metadata as part of that trace can help you understand how your system is behaving, which system components are being called and being used, and potentially identify where there are potential bottlenecks or severe problems. So these three pillars are important to have when you're building a, 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 an observability stack for your particular uh, piece of inf uh, operating system or for your particular system. If you have you know, two out of these three, that's better than none. Um, but having all three is, is kind of a really great start at being able to answer any type of question you may have in the future about the state of your system at any particular time. So traditional solutions to this came in the form of the APM or application performance monitoring uh, vendors that were around for you know, a number of years. Um, and the four steps that they considered to be important in building observability systems is to first instrument, right, being able to add pieces, either add code to your particular application or to a particular library that you happen to be using and instrument these libraries and frameworks and business logic so that they can report important aspects of that system. Um, sometimes that's in your application, right? You can add a, a, a counter to a business function so you can count how many customers you have. Um, or you're using a particular library like cache like Redis or a database, those vendors or open source projects can add you know, metrics or, or uh, they can add instrumentation to their libraries so that when you use their libraries, they can then report. Right? The second step after instrumentation is to be able to collect this data. Uh, the problem here is that you know, there's a number of different vendors, and this is kind of where I'm going with this. Right? There's a lot of different vendors with a lot of different proprietary solutions and kind of open source has really made really great progress over the last three or four years, and we'll get to that in a moment. But this data collection is really important to you know, do something with the, with the data coming out of your application. Collection, storage, you know, analyzing, processing, um, and then finally visualization, because as humans, it's really hard to look at you know, a huge uh, trace or a huge set of metric data and kind of make, infer conclusions and draw conclusions and you know, change the way you're doing things based on that data. So if you have visualizations and other ways to simplify and represent that data in a way that you can understand it or the way that you want to understand it, then you can you know, have you know, 
get actions out of that, and actionable things that you can go off and change or you can go off and fix a bug because you can understand where that issue is happening and what that issue is based on either a metric or a log file or a distributed trace. So traditional APM tools cropped up to, to solve this over the last two decades. There's many, many of them. You'll see their logos in a moment. Um, but the challenge here is that they're all different, right? And this is the challenge that we face as software developers and, and as systems engineers that you know, vendor lock-in is real in this space. Um, if you have a solution from one vendor for instrumentation, it's probably only going to work with the same solution from the same vendor for data collection or data processing. Um, and so you have to, you're essentially you know, locking yourself in. You're building, you're instrumenting your code, you're building out your data processing pipelines based on this one vendor's solution. And that, that's a real problem um, because when technology starts to move faster, which is exactly what's happened in the last decade with containers and Kubernetes and you know, microservices and serverless and AI and ML and all these things that are changing, it's really hard for these APM vendors to keep up, and it's very expensive for them to keep up as well. They have to hire more people. They're oftentimes duplicating work across different teams to meet the different needs across these different uh, solutions. And of course, that means their prices go up as well. Um, so that's a real challenge for, for the APM industry as a whole. The other real challenge for the APM industry is that they are liter both literally and figuratively playing, always playing catch up. So they're you know, looking at systems from the outside and they're looking at libraries and frameworks and virtual machines and container technologies. When those technologies change, the APM vendors have to then change their solutions to match. They're never sort of in, you know, at the ground floor. They're not part of, the, of building these solutions. They're part of solving a problem after, the, after the, the technology's been built. So they're constantly playing catch up, both figuratively and literally, uh, because they're, they're not part of these projects that they're instrumenting and that they're monitoring. So new features might come out. It's gonna take that APM vendor, you know, six months to a year to develop the, the necessary changes in their solution to be able to monitor some new change or some new paradigm like you know serverless is a great example right when serverless came around suddenly you don't have vms running for nine months at a time you have vms running for milliseconds at a time what's an apm vendor going to do if they rely on you know having this large agent installed if they need to install that agent on every single serverless invocation right that just simply is not a tenable solution so they have to build something different um, and so they've spent a lot of time trying to play catch up. Meanwhile, technologies are moving the technology forward at a very, very rapid pace. So this is why open source is really critical to a solution here, which is you know, being able to understand the different steps in an observability system and building them in to your sol open source solutions, which by the way, increasingly are being op built on open source, right? Kubernetes is a fantastic example of this. Um, and all of the projects that sit on top of Kubernetes and in the CNCF, um, these are the projects that are increasingly replacing proprietary solutions. So if we have observability solutions that match the way that those projects are both developed and delivered, um, we can really have a much more, like my higher fidelity in terms of the observability solution that we're applying to our projects, as opposed to trying to apply something that might be you know, six months behind the projects that we're using. So it's a fantastic uh, situation that we're in at the moment. Um, and that kind of you know, is, is a testament to the power of open source and the power of open communities that we can kind of all come together and, and um, kind of solve this problem as a whole. Um, and the good news is that those APM vendors that I was talking about and bad mouthing, they're also part of this solution, uh, which is fantastic to see. So, but as a, as a developer, sort of how do you get started, right? If you search on the CNCF project website for metrics or monitoring, logging, and tracing, you'll get a screen that looks like this. Um, there's, what, somewhere around 20 or 25 different solutions, right? How do you get started? What, which one are you gonna choose? Right, they all have very thing, similar things in common, but there's too many choices, and this is the problem. Um, they all have different strengths and weaknesses and kind of work together, but even if you choose an open source solution, it might not be compatible with other open source solutions, right? Just because it's open source doesn't mean that it's uh, based on an open standard. 
So that's sort of kind of what's missing here. Um, and so uh, projects like Open Swimming or Open Tracing came along. Um, open Tracing was started by, well, before Open Tracing, there were things like, you've probably heard of like Jaeger, and I think Daniel, you're gonna show Jaeger yep, in sure. the demo. Uh, before that, it was Zipkin. Anybody remember Zipkin from like 2015, 2016? Prior to that, it was Dapper uh, coming out of or or sorry, not Oracle, coming out of Google, um, and some of the folks that had started Dapper also recognized this problem, right? There was Zipkin, there was Jaeger, there was all these incompatible um, Prometheus, there was you know tons, um, and there's this proliferation of projects, which is great, but much like an open source, right? You, you sometimes you can have too much of a good thing, um, and so the idea was, you know, there's a bunch of different standards, quote unquote and different projects that are popular, like uh, Zipkin and, and Jaeger were really popular because they came around around the same time that uh, microservices started to be a big deal. So they got a lot, very popular. We used it all the time at Red Hat. Um, we did all of our demos with Zipkin. It was pretty exciting. Um, but you know, it was one of many solutions, and increasingly more and more. So open tracing was an effort to sort of stop that and come up with a, with a single standard. So how many of you recognize this cartoon? <laughs> right? It's like. <laughs> There's 14 different observability standards. That's nonsense. We only need one to rule them all. So let's make a new one called Open Tracing, and pretty soon now we have 15. <laughs> so it, it, so the, and it's not a bad idea to do this, right? But to get the critical mass and to get the, the adoption, it needs to you know solve the problem in a well in a good way. And Open Tracing did a partial great solution, right? They they brought distributed tracing. They defined what a trace was and what a distributed trace was, right? A trace is a set of spans with you know, some metadata. Um, and they also had a, a kind of a standard API for developers to instrument their code, produce metrics, or vendors to instrument their code and produce metrics. So that was pretty useful, but you know, a met, uh, an observability solution is more than just an API, right? You gotta have collectors, you gotta be able to recognize different formats and different on the wire protocols and things like that. So open tracing sort of didn't go far enough. Um, at the same time, uh, Google also started another project called Open Census because they also recognized this, that you know, th it's more than just the need of an API. So Open Census kind of added, in addition to tracing, they brought in metrics, right? That second observability pillar that I talked about earlier. Um, they also did more than just an API, right? They provided language SDKs and they provided a kind of, a, it's, it was called a, a collector, which is kind of this generic service Right, it's like a uh, running service that you can install on your systems that can take metrics from a ver various different formats, right? Jaeger or um, Open Tracing or any of the other uh, popular um, uh, observability libraries that were in use at the time, and then also ingest them and then output them to various backends and visualization systems like Jaeger or Prometheus. Um, and so it was it was pretty powerful. It kind of attached. It, it kind of solved more than what open tracing solved in that it gave you sort of this full solution that you could deploy. You, didn't, you, you weren't dependent on you know, other vendors to, to supply that. So that was pretty good. Um, so they, they did a little bit more than what open tracing did, but they also didn't have things like the log solution. Um, they didn't have a language level SDKs that you could download, right? You had to go get them from either a vendor or from another open source project. So it was you know, still not a fully complete solution. So the idea is to kind of merge those, right? So the, the, the founders of Open Tracing and Open Census came together, I think, three years ago now, and decided that you know, this is nonsense. We have too many competing uh, or complementing um, solutions. Let's just have one. So that one is called Open Telemetry, and that's where we are today. Um, so the state of the art in, in observability in open source, especially in CNCF and Kubernetes-based projects, is is open telemetry and it provides essentially the best of both open tracing as well as open census in that it has you know APIs for, well actually I can show you a slide. Um, but before I show you the slide, I wanna show you that it's the number two most popular uh, in terms of uh, activity uh, project in CNCF as of, I think this is in August. Um, you can see that the, uh, the red bubble up there is the open telemetry project, right? Lots of commits, lots of PRs, um, lots of activity in the project way more than many, many of the other projects in CNCF and almost as many as Kubernetes itself, um, which is a whole different topic. Um, but so OpenTelemetry is, is gaining a lot of traction. It has over, I think it's 800 different contributors from 
150 different companies, and many of those companies are those APM vendors I talked about early on, and you'll see a list of them on the OpenTelemetry website, which I was gonna get a screenshot of, but I didn't. Um, but what, what OpenTelemetry brings, and what you should consider when you're um, building out your, your solutions here, is three areas. So first is the specification, which is important for any standard. Uh, there's an API for um, instrumentation and emitting of, of metrics. That API is language agnostic. There's an SDK for different languages like Java or Python or Go or PHP, Ruby, uh, you know, Rust, and several others. Um, and that SDK is something you can download, right? You don't have to depend on another project to provide that. That's part of the Open Telemetry project. It also brings one of the great things from Open Tracing, which is the protocol, the Open Telemetry Line Protocol, uh, which is the you know the binary protocol that they use to transfer metric information because metrics in particular um, can grow. You know, as you add more microservices to your application, you're going to get a linear growth of metrics um, and log files as well. So having you know high performance on the network is really important, especially if you're trying to do very very high uh, accurate, you know, very very high granular uh, metrics themselves. So, um, so it brings a protocol, it brings an SDK for li or languages, and it brings a, you know a standard API, as well as a standard that says what different languages must support. So, if you want to support a new language in OpenTelemetry, there is a specification for that. So that defines the the native types in each language and how they map to the different um, fields in metrics or logs or distributed traces. So. It's a really great system that kind of defines end-to-end -end what um, a, a, an observability system looks like and how to, how it, how to, how to collect that data, um, how to export the data out of your applications, how to put them into your storage systems. And then this allows APM vendors and other observability vendors to compete higher level on the stack. So they can compete with things like AI ops, where you can you know, process and analyze the data and make infer what's happening in your system and what might happen in the future, right? These are areas that OpenTelemetry does not implement, but vendors can implement on top, and there's many vendors that are doing exactly that. So, um, best of both worlds. Um, it's a fantastic solution for observability. Um, so, the next question is, well, what about Java? Java is particularly close at heart at Red Hat. Uh, we acquired JBoss back in 2006. We have a number of Java-based solutions. Java has historically had a problem on the cloud, right? Let's face it. It's it's slow and fat and takes up too much memory and takes too long to start. So for Java to really compete in these spaces, those issues need to be addressed. And there's a number of, of projects addressing that, both in Java itself, in the OpenJDK, um, as well as in projects like Quarkus, which uh, Daniel and I are, are near that team at Red Hat, uh, building out um, you know, solutions to eliminate all these kinds of startup and heavy memory usage of Java and, and make Java something that you would experience like a node developer get, has had for a number of years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, fast startup times and low memory. Quarkus actually beats node, by the way, um, in a number of use cases. So it's a fantastic solution, but um, you know, Java's one space where the technology is moving forward. Serverless is another space. Um, you know, containers and Kubernetes in general. And so how do these things all come together to, um, to solve the challenges that we have in building enterprise grade solutions today, which a number of Solutions are built on Java. Um, so Daniel, I'm going to hand it over to Daniel to talk about um, how we go forward with serverless Java. So Thank Daniel. you so much, James. All right. Uh, so here's the thing is how do we actually enable Java application to observability on open telemetry and specifically serverless applications. So James already mentioned earlier. So it's, a, it's not good practice you print like an agent in the serverless application. It's pretty awkward. That's why we need to uh, approach something different way how to uh, monitor or uh, collect the telemetry data from the serverless application, regardless of Java, .NET, or some other stuff. But we're going to do pretty much focus on the K-native stuff. So just quick, uh, in case some people uh, uh, never heard about before of a Quarkus thing. So Quarkus uh, is a totally game changer for Java application, not only serverless, but also its general Java application for business workload, we make a super easy and then fast and then uh, lightweight, not only serverless, but also all React application or even general uh, Java application on top of that. So with that, we shipped a lot of stuff from runtime activity uh, shipped to uh, back to build time. That's why 
uh, when you run Java applications, it's pretty much faster than uh, uh, compared to traditional, like a Spring Boot or even JavaC EAP, the other stuff. As you can see in the bottom line, you can see we ship the all kind of activity, for example, uh, annotation scanning and parsing descriptor and enable to disable some of the feature. And in the end, when you run the application as a thread or a process on top of JVM, it actually run your business service rather than uh, the processing bunch of stuff uh, behind the scene. And then uh, Quarkus provide and enable Java developer to build an executable just exe extend the file in Windows operating system. You don't need to JVM anymore. You can just run the application right away, just like a Node.js, and then it's pretty much faster than. And then let's go into the demo. I have only 15 minutes left. Okay, pretty cool. So this is my local environment, and then here's my actually uh, I already created the, this morning the Quarkus project. So this is the raised Quarkus version, and I already downloaded a bunch of the Quarkus extension, which I call. And then we can understand the maybe uh, dependency. One of the good thing is here the uh, so Quarkus Open Telemetry Explorer OTLT. So which allows developer integrate uh, your open telemetry stuff. So James mentioned earlier you gotta need to run some SDK or API or some kind of uh, some of protocol stuff to instrument data and collect data, uh, telemetry data. This is one of the big challenges for developer how to figure it out. However, Quarkus actually provides this kind of extension which he, uh, make developer feel comfortable to use this kind of thing. And then, and I just create two simple the RESTful API here. So just the endpoint hello, and then uh, here we bunch of three RESTful API, like a hello from REST Easy, and then like a welcome open source summit Japan 22, in the last uh, the REST API, like just like our session title, distributing tracing integration with the Quarkus k neighbor and hotel. And let's try to run my local environment uh, to make sure the application totally working before I deploy to Kubernetes as a serverless. So first up, the Quarkus, uh, the dev mode, uh, you can actually use your Maven or Gradle, the packaging tool, whatever you need. And then one of the good things, the Quarkus CLI is uh, pretty much easier to uh, run and uh, verify your application. Now you can see I have uh, the Quarkus application here. Oh, I just forgot one thing. I actually need to back to my application. I already set it up Docker Compose file to run the Jaeger and then uh, open telemetry server based on Docker container. So this is just some more the known practice for developer, how even ops people how to run your application rather than installation you just pull the relevant container image it's running on it. And then here's the, uh, our Jaeger and this kind of stuff. And then back to my terminal. Uh, let's try to use Docker Composed, uh, Compose Up. Okay, oh. Docker com Compose Up. It automatically start. And then back to here, let's try to make sure and I have a two uh, Docker process running. One is Hotel, Open Telemetry. The other one is the Jaeger. And then, so here is the endpoint. I just copy, and then back to the UI, and then try to localhost here. And then now I have the Jaeger UI in, in totally my local. As you can see, this is a, this is a my local host. And then back to my terminal and switch my another one and I try to run uh, Quarkus Dev. And it allows the, uh, run my local environment as well as connect to backend Jaeger and that kind of server. Because when I go back to my application directory, I already set up my application properly. And then, and then you can see I have, the one of the beauty of the Quarkus actually provide the unified configuration so if you have some experience to develop Java application with a multiple environment, like a pre-product staging or production and developer testing environment, et cetera, maybe you need to uh, create a separate like a YAML file or a property file to maintaining that kind of stuff. And it sometimes occurs like a, some error, like a human error. The, the Quarkus actually uh, provides like a prefix feature, which allows you just to pick it up, a relevant configuration for dev environment, production package, or testing model. So here's my service name. 
and I'm going to enable open telemetry. This is only one I need to do. And then here is the, my local open telemetry port, which are the eyes. Here, the set it up my Docker Compose file. But this is all default configuration. You can actually uh, skip it, all kind of stuff. But I just make sure and explicitly how I set up, uh, connect to my backend upper telemetry server from my Java application. So you can actually uh, delete all kind of stuff because you, as long as you enable open telemetry extension on Quarkus in the Java application, it automatically incorporates your application into open telemetry and it will send your telemetry data back in Jaeger server. All right, and back the application. Here we go. Uh, press D, it all out, uh, go to like uh, our dev UI, which is one of the great feature for developer. It showcase a unified uh, graphical interface, uh, what kind of extension capability you already have on your application. As you can see, here is open telemetry stuff, and then there are a bunch of the reactive and configuration you already have. And then let's try to reload my Jaeger server, and now have my services already here. But when I just click on uh, find traces, it's all about like uh, some default data, like a dev UI, not actual application. When I go to operation, you, you don't see the RESTful API. And I go back to terminal window and open this one and then try to access one of the RESTful API, like a hello. And now you can see hello from, I'm gonna make it bigger for you. And then and hello from Rest EG and go back to Jaeger UI and I'm gonna reload the Jaeger. And now you can see operation now, hello. I got a one hint and then got to find the trace. Now you gotta have a one Jaeger stuff. So this is how it works and open telemetry actually uh, collect data and then just back to uh, Jaeger server, which is cool. And then let me try to call a different UI, like a, like a greeting. And now you can see welcome open source survey Japan and my name is Dan and then one more thing, hotel. And now you can see uh, this being in the kind of stuff here. And I'm back to the Jaeger. And then I'm just reload this page. And you can see the hello greeting, hello hotel. So now I can see the instant re grab the rest of API trace data. If I just uh, call one more time and then just try in the second traces, this is totally working. So my challenge is how to make it happen in the same capability into. Kubernetes cluster, like a production environment, specifically k neighbor services as a serverless function. Because my application functionality totally the same, it's only different, it's a serverless, it's a deployment model. So the same business logic, but the application make it, uh, is just shutting down and upon based on your traffic, network traffic, not related to your business logic. So one of the good thing is Quarkus actually provide OpenShift extension, which I go back to, uh, Palm XML, you can see here the Quarkus OpenShift extension, which allows me to deploy this application to OpenShift cluster based on Kubernetes. I can deploy my application to vanilla Kubernetes and OpenShift Red Hat, like enterprise version of the Kubernetes, but also I can deploy as k neighbor services. The behind the scene, it automatically generates like a YAML file for k native or Quarkus, uh, like OpenShift and uh, Kubernetes stuff. And then one good thing is I already uh, defined the production configuration here. I'm gonna deploy uh, to Kubernetes true and deploy in target K native. And then here is my namespace name. And then when I, today I'm gonna use the uh, Red Hat Developer Sandbox, which is built on Kubernetes. When you go to uh, developer, developers at redhat.com, uh, it, uh, or else you signed up for free, you can have like a Kubernetes cluster for the next 30 days and you can actually keep extending uh, as long as you wanna uh, keep using that. And also it uh, provides a bunch of tutorial how to get started your application, not only Java, .NET, and then a bunch of stuff. So I'm gonna use this kind of stuff. And I already uh, deploy a Jaeger. And then I actually go to administrator and then show you, I'll make a bigger, and I already installed uh, Jaeger as operator, and I already installed OpenTelemetry as an operator as well. And here's OpenShift serverless bit in Knative. That's why you can see, so here's the Knative stuff. And then back to the application. So as James mentioned, it's a bad practice, so you wanna set it up like an agent for your application for serverless. 
So that's why here is my KNAV servicing stuff. I've set it up like a backend GKIN server, one of the popular like a logo aggregation things. So and then it actually point to my backend Yeager server with my hotel KNAV namespace. So I just copy from here. And then I just uh, import to that YAML file, which is one of the great thing of a developer sandbox. And then which you install based on the KNAV serving namespace. And it allows to uh, spin up the bunch of a pod in the end. And then in the meantime, and then go back to here. And then here is the another uh, hotel kind of stuff. So this is another uh, open telemetry thing. In order to create the hotel, as you can see here, the exporter and the receiver. So I just create the KNAV service based on Jipkin server. And that's why receiver Jipkin. And then we're going to export to that telemetry data into the Jaeger server already installed uh, using operator on Kubernetes. So this is the uh, how to make it happen in the Kubernetes cluster. And now you can see we have a bunch of that kind of stuff. And then when you go back to developer standpoint, like a topology view, you can see here's a bunch of things uh, running on like a pod uh, for your KNAV services. And then it based on like a, some like a pretty slow Wi-Fi internet. Okay. Okay, so now you can see there are a bunch of the pods already uh, running on based on KNAV. And then I'm going to go to uh, create a new one, something like the open telemetry, and then uh, based on my namespace, I just create that, and then here is my open telemetry, and then it just creates a new one. Okay, so let's give it some moment, and then back to my application. Now I'm going, going to run my application on the Quarkus build. I'm going to skip unit test to save my time. So this one command line actually allows me to uh, build my application like a job file. You can actually do that like a native executable also, and then it containerizes your application based on a container image. And then it will deploy to like a container registry. Like a, today I'm going to use integrate container registry inside the OpenShift cluster. However, you can actually do like a Docker Hub, like a Azure container registry or Google stuff. And then the last thing is Kubernetes download the container image and running on KNAV services as a part of the server labs. So happening a lot of stuff behind the scene, but I just need to run one single command line and it automatically happening. Because when I go back to my application and under the target directory, and the Kubernetes directory automatically create that, and you can see the KNAV service YAML automatically generated. And also here's a Kubernetes YAML file also generated to create like a Kubernetes manifest. And then when you go back to my application, and then here is the Jaeger UI, it's, it's one of the good thing is it provide uh, authentication uh, based on the OpenShift cluster uh, automatically, like a single sign -on stuff. Oh, okay. So you don't need to create uh, some the user authentication and authorization. So this is the, there's no kind of uh, service at this moment. And then here's my open telemetry, and it will come up with a new serverless application into here. And then we're going to just to invoke the same RESTful API, like a hello, greeting, or hotel. And then automatically, open telemetry pick it up, that telemetry data from my serverless application. And even if the serverless application goes down and it's automatically spin up, when I invoke the RESTful API, open telemetry uh, automatically uh, pick that up, open uh, telemetry data, uh, without any uh, kind of uh, the uh, code modification. So now we have a new application here coming up soon. The application container creating, and then uh, can you go click on view logs? And then now you can see Quarkus application is now running. And then back to the topology view. And here's my Quarkus application. And then here's the RESTful API endpoint. And then back to the application. And then I'm going to go to, uh, for example, hello. And then we could go to uh, Jaeger UI and we load the application. And then it will coming up soon uh, based on the serverless application. Now you can see we have a serverless, and this is actually the serverless name. When I go back to the application, this is the serverless name. And then go to find trace, and then we can have the hello RESTful API. That's the thing. And I go back to one more time. We almost are running over time. 
uh, just hotel, and then I will get time two times, and I'm back to the UI, and then now you can see, so new operation just uh, created here, like a hotel, and the find trace, and the two trace. And then the app, the serverless application will goes down by default 30 seconds, and it's a default k-neighbor services, and then, and then when you just invoke the rest of API once again, it uh, open telemetry uh, pick up automatically. So yeah, thanks for joining today. And if you have any question, and then we are more than happy to address in the after session on the aisle or hallway. Is there any question from virtual audience, by the way? Okay, the silence is good. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, the open telemetry always running. That is not serverless. Serverless only for application side. Yeah, this is a, some kind of infrastructure. Yeah. Yeah, collect automatically. So yeah. Yeah, that's correct. So this open telemetry just infrastructure, I just showcase in the same name space, but in reality for production environment, you have to install uh, the other like, namespace for infrastructure like a node, and then when you set it up, uh, that kind of thing uh, based on the label, and then the Jenkins server label, it automatically detects you that you're serverless. So in the meantime, our serverless scale down to zero, like as uh, Amazon Lambda, and then when I go back to just call the one to invoke, and then it automatically spin up, like just Amazon Lambda calls that strategy. And then when I go back to uh, let the Riego thing, and then now you can see, so the other services came out number four, which means the other service is here. So I don't even set it up like an agent stuff, it's automatically detected because these k neighbor service automatically uh, set it up the integration between uh, your OpenTel and then your k neighbor service based on your the application label. So one thing to add on that um, is that the question you asked kind of implies that in order to use open telemetry, you have to change the code. And that's not always the case. A lot of what open telemetry can do can do without touching your code, like tracing network calls or database updates and the, the caching piece of that. So you don't necessarily always have to add code to your application to send metrics. You can automatically be sent from the framework that you're using in your application. The only reason you would add metrics to your application is if you wanted to trace like business logic metrics, like number of customers or number of orders received over a time. Yep. Is that answer for you? Oh. Yeah, we're going to talk to Reggie later. Okay. Is there any other question back there? Okay. Yeah, just last question. So actually, two questions, but since we got not much time, so I'm only going to ask one. So, like, open telemetry consists of matrix tracing and logging, right? So, what are you guys doing on logging? So, for example, are you stitching the tracing data and the logging data together? But because in Jaeger, we can only see how the tracing flow is going. But if you want to see, like, the actual logs in there, what um, are you guys actually doing in there? So, uh, yeah, so the question is what are we doing about logging and open telemetry? So, logging is important. It is the third pillar. It's not the, not completely done yet. It's in beta form. Um, the plan is to have a VA for that, I think sometime early next year. Um, and in that case, you can, of course, do the traditional standalone logging, like log dot whatever. You can also include logging in the metrics. And so those logs get exported as part of a particular metric so that you know, log statements and log metadata can be associated with a particular um, uh, trace. And so it's a particular span Okay. Yep. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks for joining today. Yeah.